All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our, our Bidding Wars Multiple Offer Tips class. Uh, Carrie is uh, going to be gracious enough to start us off, and uh, we want questions, input, so don't, don't hesitate to interrupt it at any point. Definitely. Um, ask your questions, and this is not a one size fits all type situation. So these are just ideas that um, I've seen work, um, you know, both as a listing agent and a buyer's agent in this market. Um, so just getting your mind thinking about, you know, creative ways to get your clients under contract because um, it's tricky, right? So how can you stand out? Um, and it's not always, you know, the highest offer. And I think that's you know, thinking about more than just that purchase price. I would say the number is important, but there's other contingencies in our offers, right? That we want to um, want to keep in mind. So, um, so your client finds a property that they are in love with. They want to make an offer. Um, the first thing I usually do is give that listing agent a call. If this information, I first check MLS and see if these questions are answered already for me so that we're not bothering them because usually there's lots of calls and emails if you have a, a hot listing so um making sure that we're being um mindful of that so asking them when do they want to move out of the property so is there a certain closing date that they are looking for um and then i always ask if we're thinking about using an escalation clause and we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth later but will they present an escalation clause, is that something that the agent is comfortable with um, and they feel comfortable um, presenting and explaining to their client? Um, we certainly don't want to not be considered because we use that and they're not feeling so confident with it. So um, I always check to make sure that that would be a welcome addition to an offer. Um, and then is there anything else that we should know that's important to them? Like, do they want to, you know, maybe there's a chandelier they want to take and um, I don't know, anything else that we should know to just make a really clean offer right out of the gate. Um, and then also I will ask if they will present a personal letter, video, whatever it is from my clients. So I know some people are not presenting those anymore, so I'm not going to have my client go through the trouble of writing up the letter if it's just going to be um, not presented. So I'll ask Here, about I have, that. A, I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. Um, and, and I also, I disclaim, uh, I apologize. I, <laughs> there were people waiting in the waiting room and the mess oh. was, wasn't popping <laughs> up. So for those of you that got in late, we had just started like 20 <laughs> seconds before that. So I am so sorry, but anyway, um, I, I just had a question. What, what are we seeing as far as, um, cause I, I, I haven't been carrying any listings really over the winter. Um, but like, I felt like in the fall, like listing agents, especially were getting like, um, getting tired of escalation clauses. And I was starting to hear that, like a lot of agents were saying, you know, we won't be looking at any or whatever. I mean, are they still widely accepted? Is it, you know, are agents hoping that those aren't used? <laughs> um, I mean, I know, I know they can't stop us from using them, but I just was curious if, if, if I know we were there seeing are a, a few towards... instances and in certain agents in particular that I noticed consistently have a note saying that they will not present, um, hey Kim, um, will not present an escalation. But I think for the most part, people are okay with it. Um, I haven't found too many people who were All like- right. And I think we have to be careful of that. Like an agent should never be saying, I'm not going to present you know, this or that, or I, I'm not going to present a letter from your buyer. Like that's up to the seller. If the seller has given you instructions, if you've counseled your seller and say, Hey, I think it's best that we, we don't do escalation clauses, then sure. That instruction can come from the seller, but of course, legally we have to present everything. So I think, you know, we have to be real careful, you know, um, you know, about that. And just because the listing agent says something, if your buyer wants to do something, then you kind of have to do it. And I think as listing agents, we have to present whatever comes in just to, to cover our butts. But I think if um, if 
the sellers become overwhelmed with the, the number of offers or the escalations and all the different contingencies. Uh, we just go back and say highest and best, just contact everyone, highest and best and push. push yeah, the I mean, that's not a bad, I mean, you know, of course it's always highest and best in those multiple offer situations, but I have seen some of those, you know, like just doing a reset, like just saying, you know, what, once you've established what the market is, you know, say you listed it for 300, but you get eight offers over 350 or something, you know, per your seller's instructions, you could go back to everyone and say, my seller has instructed me to tell everyone we're only looking at, you know, cash offers over 350 or, you know, uh, offers over 350 with no inspections or with a flexible closing date or, you know, whatever. So that that's certainly a good strategy, you know, on the listing side and something to be prepared for on, on the buyer side. So well, I know I'm the I'm the northern agent, but I use the escalation clause on almost every offer I'm in multiple offer with. And I also use the affirmation of offer form most of the time. And I do get a lot of blowback and questions about that, but I just feel like using that gives my buyer um, a lot better feel if we don't win. Yeah, Carrie, why don't you, uh, not every agent might be aware that's out there. Um, yeah, well, Tanya, you're you're the expert on that. Or, 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 or Tanya. Explain actually. what it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. what is that? <laughs> the, the affirmation of offer, You, you if you're the buyer agent, you sign it and you submit that with, um, with your offer and the listing agent just signs saying, acknowledging that they have presented the offer. Yeah, it's in the right forms. In form. That, that yeah. way, you know your that way you know your offer was actually presented, and the seller saw it. And you can give that to your buyer if you lose, yeah. and then people have less bad feelings. They can also sign a counter offer on that affirmation of offer form. But a lot, I find that a lot of agents don't know, don't understand it, or they get offended. And I just explain this just protects you and I. So people, so the buyers understand that their offer was presented. Now you guys mm -hmm. in Portland, you, you, you know, I'm submitting, I'm competing with, you know, maybe 10 offers at a time. If you're competing with 40 offers and that, that other form probably wouldn't be appropriate and would just irritate the listing agent. Yeah, they shouldn't get irritated. That's silly, but I, I hear you. Yeah. Um, well, that's on here. They, on our list here of things like building rapport with that other agent and not um, being annoying, um, for lack of a <laughs> word, I guess. Um, you know, because yeah. if you do um, have a busy listing and it's, you know, you're setting up showings, um, dealing with all that, and then there's obviously going to be questions, which is totally understandable. But if you're reaching out just to reach out, you know, sometimes I'll have an agent text me, call me, email me you know, 10 different times with how many offers you have, how many offers you have. And it's like, okay, like, why don't you go ahead and put in, I've told you it's multiple offers. Are you going to make a different offer, whether it's eight offers or 25 offers, you know, like, you know, please submit your best offer. Um, and that you have to work with this person through the whole transaction. So the way that you present yourself um, from the beginning, if it's someone that's not familiar with you is important. Um, in my opinion, it's like, you know, if they seem like scattered and hectic, they can't give you a full offer package, you know, with everything in there and, you know, the correct property. Um, you know, I've seen lots of different um, offers that obviously people are just reusing in zip forms, the same, you know, contract package over and over, which is totally fine. Why wouldn't you? But take the time to go through and update you know, the date that you're submitting the offer, um, the names of the other agent, um, make sure they're spelled properly. Um, the sellers, you know, the sellers can just be annoyed if you spell their name wrong or whatever. So just don't give them anything to be <laughs> agitated over, right? Um, fill it out nice and clean. Um, and with, you know, the correct property information um, updated on there, I can't tell you how many times, like I said, I have seen um, just messy and it looks like you're not really paying attention. They're not serious about it. And that, you know, the sellers don't know that this is their 12th offer that they've made. Right. So they like, oh, well, that's just the deed from the last property. You know, you and I might understand that, but sellers that do this maybe once or twice in their life, they don't understand, you know, so think about like putting yourself in that person's shoes and 
how would you want someone to behave if you were the listing agent or you were the seller and try to think from that perspective and not just, um, you know, what we're trying to do is right for our client. But I think putting yourself in that space can help you get to that place of picking up on their cues and what they want. And um, again, it's not a one size fits all situation here. And you might treat one offer totally different than you treat the next offer just based on, you know, the situation that you're dealing with. Um, I saw Kimmy wrote in the chat. Um, yeah, missing information. And it just, um, yeah, it leads you to think like, are they taking this seriously? And, you know, are they just throwing in offers to see if one sticks, right? That's yeah, as buyer agents for, for main real estate experts, like, I, I mean, I can't believe this is still a thing. I mean, I, I, it, I knew it used to be a thing, but like in this day and age, you can't be submitting offers without an earn, you know, without uh, a prequal letter. I mean, that, that's just, you know, crazy, I think, and, and, and sloppy. And, you know, it's, it's literally like the first thing. Well, okay. It's not the first thing I look for. I'm, I'm looking at the price on the offer and stuff first, but like, if there, if there's not a pre-approval letter attached, like I'm going right back to that agent and, and yeah, my confidence just went way down um, in dealing, um, you know, with that agent, as far as, you know, ha having their act together and being someone that I would want to work with or have my yeah. seller work with. So definitely. Um, and the other thing while you're in this preparation stage with your offer is to reach out to the lender um, and have them run the property through to see if it qualifies for an appraisal waiver. Um, this would be a really strong attribute to your offer. Um, most lenders understand how busy agents are and how hard we're working to get people under contract and they will. Um, it takes some time. Honestly, it's not easy. It's not like they just put the address in and it comes right up. They have to like fully submit the file as if the offer had been accepted. Um, so it does take them a little bit of time um, to do this, but cer certainly worthwhile and could be the difference between you getting your offer accepted and not because at that point you're almost, almost, almost as good as cash, right? There's still financing contingency, but you know um, there's no appraisal happening. So that's one less worry for the seller. Um, where do you put an appraisal waiver? Um, do you mean in the offer? Is that what you're asking? Um, you could write it right in section 26, um, or you could have the le uh, the lender add it to their pre-approval letter that this property has qualified at you know, this price for an appraisal waiver. Yeah, either one of those would be fine. Um, so yeah, checking on that to make sure. And then also if your client has um, the ability like, Obviously, it's very difficult to get people under contract with government loans. So working closely with your lender to try to figure out what's the strongest type of financing that they can qualify for. Um, and then another step that I always take is having my lenders call out to that listing agent and reiterate the strength of the buyer and that this is not just a pre-qualification, that they've run them all the way through as far as they can at that point. Um, and that they are in you know, great shape. They just need to assign a property to the um, buyer's file. And this just gives the listing agent more confidence that um, you know, they're working with a reputable lender that takes the time to do that. I've had more people um, accept when this happens and, and mention it as part of the reason that they accepted um, because they felt confident that you know the lender was already involved. Um, they don't just get a standard boilerplate, you know, approval letter. Um, it's just one one more thing that we can do for our buyers to help them stand out. So I think that's a really worthwhile um, thing to do and ask your um, your lenders to help you. Um, you know, they should be partners with you in this process. Um, so when you're putting your package together, you're getting all of the um, all of the documents together. So the synopsis, the purchase and sale. If there's an escalation, any addendums, um, you know, proof of funds or financing letter, disclosure, deed, everything packaged together that they would need um, for their file. So it's and submitting it all together in one email. I think it's really important because if they're getting 
you know, 40 offers and they have to search through, oh, you sent the disclosure here and the purchase and sale here and the lender's letter here. Yeah, again, just trying to make their life easier and giving them one clean, neat package, um, I think is a great way to, to start and stand out. I'm um, curious, yeah. um, what, are, what are some different programs that people use? Um, I, I use PDF Binder. I think it was free. Um, don't quote me on that, but it certainly didn't, didn't cost much, but um, it lets me, you know, add all my PDFs um, and then I can sort the order that I want them to bind together in. Um, I don't know if there's some other program out there. That... Yeah, I just use DocuSign and you can download like the complete file once it's signed as one package. So Oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, when you initially send it to the buyer. I just create a blank file in zip forms, put it all, upload them all in and download them as one document too. So there's a bunch of different ways that you yeah. can but I think the order is really important. Like, you know, put them in the order that, you know, like when you get an offer, what, you know, what are you first looking for? Like a lot of time, you know, like I said, me personally, I'll put the pre-approval letter, you know, first, you know, just because it's one page um, and, you know, so it's easy to blow past that. And now the, the, the agent knows, okay, we've got the, the pre-call letter or whatever. And a lot of times I'll put the check second and then I'll put the offer or maybe if the buyer's written a letter, I'll, you know, put that first, but, you know, you know, I might put some single page stuff that's important, you know, first, you know, that they're going to be able to get through real quick. And then they get to the offer, obviously, you know, put all that other stuff, you know, at the end, they don't, you know, they'll think you were really thorough for having the deed initialed and the MLS sheet and the disclosure and the lead paint and all that, you know, and everything properly filled in. Um, you know, again, it makes you look really thorough when you forget to have your buyer, um, you know, check off or initial the, you know, the acknowledgement on the lead paint, or you've left their name off the top of something, or you didn't have them sign or initial something, you know, it makes you look sloppy, um, I think. Um, and I, and I know it's nitpicky, but again, the listing agents looking for, you know, they have 10 offers, they're looking for a good partner. Um, so anything could be used against you and your buyer, so. So I use, um, I'm an Apple user. I use PDF Expert and I think it's a pro version. I think I paid like 79 bucks or maybe a hundred bucks for it. It's a one-time fee, but I like it because I can, it, it, it's just faster to reorder. I know there are some free programs out there, but I have no patience. So if you're doing any kind of volume, I just, I want to be able to just do things really quickly. Um, so I like PDF Expert. You can also, I Oops, sorry, mark up, you can also like mark up documents, you know, you can, I, it's got a bunch of other features you, I might lose, use for a listing, like to draw arrows and again, breaking stuff apart really quickly for Skyslope or whatever. Um, it, I'm, I'm all about it. Makes it easier too. Yeah. yeah. Skyslope yeah. will allow you also to, um, to send in a, in a bundle. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. if you're, you know, it'll, it'll send it as a PDF. Uh -huh. So if you are using Skyslope for all of your files, you can do that as well and just forward it to the agent. So obviously lots of options. Don't be that agent that's sending six attachments, you know, in the email. A lot of us are working on our phones. We're reviewing these, you know, offers on the road, in our car, from our phone. And it just, it makes everybody's life, you know, more difficult. And then we have to send it, you know, to the seller and, you know, much easier to send them one package than, you know, an email with six attachments and they have to figure out which one is, is the one they really want to look at. So. Yeah. And that way, you know, things might get overlooked too, if they're just looking for that purchase and sale and they're not going to take the time to look if you did write a letter at the financing or whatever. So if it's all together, you know, that they're going to see everything that's included. Yeah. On that letter, I wanted to comment, like, obviously every agent has to do what they, you know, feel is right for them and their clients. Um, I know there's a lot of talk out there about, no, we shouldn't be writing letters anymore, or no, we shouldn't be letting our sellers see them. Uh, you know, may maybe I'm, uh, you know, uh, slow to come around or whatever, but I, I personally think they're still important. Um, I, I certainly don't think a buyer or a buyer's agent, um, you know, is, is going to get in trouble for writing one. Uh, certainly if, 
you know, you're putting information in there that, you know, could be used um, to, to discriminate, you know, um, for, for a protected housing class, and then the seller or and the listing agent are using that information to pick you, okay, now you're going to have a problem. Um, but, you know, personally, I, I don't think as long as you keep it professional, um, that there's a problem, again, in submitting it. And as a listing agent, I personally don't think, you know, there's a problem, you know, letting your seller review those. Um, certainly, if you get one, and that you think for some, you know, crazy reason uh, could be an issue, um, then probably you're going to advise your seller, um, you know, that, that, you know, you, this offer did, did, did include a letter um, for, you know, fair housing reasons. I don't believe that I should, you know, transmit this, uh, you know, to you. And, and you probably want to talk to me, you know, uh, or, or your office owner about a situation like that. You know, there have been situations that were borderline or, you know, things that we might have to report, um, you know, for a fair housing violation, because we, we certainly, you know, would rather self-report something than, you know, have something come up, you know, later. But as far as not using those, um, you know, personally, I'm not, not a fan of that. And, and again, you may want to write a letter or a cover email or something with your buyer's offer too, just to let the agent know not only why they should pick your buyer, but why they should pick, you know, your buyer's offer because of what you're going to do to make sure the transaction, um, you know, closes. That's good. I do see, you know, some people are definitely still presenting them, but some people are just very much scared to or opposed to it. And I know Vicki, you said that you saw someone say they don't allow them to be presented. Um, I think, I can't remember what company that is, but I know I'm familiar with what you're talking about. Um, they, yeah, they don't want to see them. And that's why I always ask that question up front. So nobody's you know, writing a letter if it's not going to be presented, but if you are writing letters, just be careful what you're talking about. Stick to things they liked about the house and, you know, they have beautiful gardens and, you know, your client loves to garden or whatever, things like that, that are, you know, not hot button um, issues that could get you in trouble if you are going to write the letters. Um, what if your buyer delivers the letter to the house themselves with a fruit basket? Like, is that? Uh, can't stop them. Yeah. Can't stop them, right? I don't yeah. know. Bill, you're a genius. <laughs> Evil genius, maybe. Well, the whole arrangement people love you. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I think there's yeah so much creativity going on in the market that you know certainly you got to think outside the box. So that's a really good example. Um, do you want to talk about um, contingencies, Bill? Sure. Um, so, uh, of course, we all know about investigations. Again, I, you know, some of you, um, because you just had a hot listing or maybe, you know, you were, had a buyer that was, you know, one of 10 offers on a listing, you know, will know better um, as far as what's, you know, more common nowadays. Um, like I said, I've, I've always been a big fan of carefully um, advising your buyer that, not doing investigations is an option. I mean, especially in a situation where, you know, you're doing 10, 20, 30, $40,000 over asking, um, are we really, you know, concerned about, you know, again, it, it's very property specific. Is it, a, is it a newer property? Is it on public water, public sewer? Is the roof newer? Is the boiler newer? Like, you know, what are the big things with the property and what are the chances that, you know, something's going to, you know, need a costly repair. But I mean, I, I feel like I, I'm hearing and seeing more of either investigations not being used at all and, and or especially, um, uh, you know, language that, you know, is very specific as far as, you know, the buyer's only going to, um, you know, uh, cons consider repairs, you know, over $2,000 or over $5,000, you know, something major. Um, and I think certainly um, if your buyer is not comfortable, you know, not doing repairs. And again, we can never advise not to do repairs, but I think we, we have to give our buyers all the options because if they find out later that they lost and the reason they lost is because, um, 
you know, they had inspections and the winning buyer didn't. And some agents will tell you this, you know, and, and quite frankly, I, I think that that's fine. And it's, it's a way to build rapport with agents, you know, back, back on the, you know, there's so many ways to build rapport with agents. And a lot of it happens prior to the transaction, you know, that you're currently in, you know, um, I've heard of situations where, um, you know, uh, one agent's buyer, got, you know, they, they won the bidding process because the listing agent essentially liked them or respected how they treated them in a, you know, in a similar situation when they were on the other side and maybe they lost. Um, but, you know, you know, you're the buyer agent now, but you were the listing agent before and, and just how you handled the process, um, you know, was, was able, you know, you, you impress that agent with, um, you know, sometimes agents just like to know, you know, why their buyer lost and you can do that without, um, you know, revealing uh, confidential information about the winning offer. Uh, but, you know, maybe it was cash, maybe it was financing, maybe it was, you know, over a certain price. I mean, you can give some generalities just to, you know, let other agents know where they stand. Um, you know, so I, I think that's all important. So, um, uh you know, again, I think a lot of you are already using it, you know, buyer agrees to not ask for any repairs um, or a price reduction um, for, you know, items over a certain value. Um, you know, I think, I think those are, uh, that's something that you can use. Um, another contingency we, um, we've talked about a little recently is the appraisal gap uh, clause. Um, I know we sent out some language um, about that. Um, something, and thank you, Tanya, for, <laughs> for reminding me, it, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, and it doesn't get mentioned a lot, but there is a clause library um, in zip forms, um, and there is an appraisal gap, you know, language um, in there already. So you, you have to be in an addendum or in section 26 or something like that. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Tanya can correct me, but you know, you need to be in the document and then the clause library will, you know, be up uh, in the menu and you can pull that down and insert um, a clause. But, um, you know, they're, they're, that appraisal gap language is in there for you if you don't want to think of uh, if you don't want to think about uh, the wording of that or how or how to write that. So, um, you know, again, in the past, a lot of agents and a lot of companies aren't big fans of um, the seller, you know, occupying after closing or you know renting the property back or that sort of thing. But again, in this market, you know where your buyer can lose out a lot, you know, you, you know, again, you have to properly counsel them, but there may be some of these risks that they want to take. And again, I think we still have to present those options, you know, with the proper caveats, um, you know, to the buyer. So um, again, allowing the seller to rent back, maybe you let the seller, you know, stay for 30 days for free. Maybe the buyer's got a secure rental or they're staying with friends or family or, you know, their situation's flexible. And so, you know, you can give the seller that flexibility and that may be the reason why your buyer wins above and beyond, you know, price. Um, so that's something that you can look out, um, look out for. Um, one of the options uh, that I, so I was listening to, uh, and we're gonna send all this stuff out to you after, like all the stuff that we're covering. So um, don't worry about writing it down, but you'll see some of the stuff um, was taken from, uh, I, I was listening to this great podcast um, one day on a walk, and um, I've, I've given full credit to that on the, um, on the stuff we'll send to you later, but uh, giving the seller a move out weekend, you know, um, where, you know, you close on Friday, but they get the whole weekend um, to move out, you know, that can be, you know, a huge uh, stress relief um, for the seller. Um, Maybe, maybe you put in a flexible seller closing clause and that can sound something like, uh, you know, buyer is willing to close within 30 to 90 days at the seller's discretion, you know, with at least, you know, two weeks notice or something like that. Um, you know, just to give the seller that flexibility as far as um, what they need. Um, uh, if you've ever moved before, a lot of us know the, the worst thing about moving is having to go back to that house that you just moved out of to clean it. 
Um, so, you know, maybe you're offering or your buyer's offering to have the house cleaned uh, for the seller, you know, or you're putting some clause in the contract, like, you know, buyer will, will accept home as is, you know, after seller move out and will take full responsibility for uh, cleaning. Or, or again, maybe you're sending a cleaner um, in there. Um, this podcast that I was listening to, um, the agent was actually, um, they actually worked with a local vendor, a cleaner, and they got gift certificates and they were sending those with the offer, um, you know, for the seller to use for, you know, free cleaning services, you know, obviously up to a certain amount, whatever, maybe it was $500. And again, this might, um, you know, your buyer might not be the highest price, but some of these little extras that you can um, put in there or some of these um, things that the, the, the buyer's willing to be flexible on, you know, you may find that the seller wants to work with you or the listing agent encourage the seller to work with you because, you know, you're being courteous, you're being flexible, you're being, you know, you're willing to work with the seller um, and, you know, do some things for them that are creative, um, you know, that cause them to want to work, um, you know, work with you. So has anyone seen anything really creative um, or, you know, has your buyer, you know, done something creative or, you know, have you gotten any multiple offers with creative stuff, Connie? Um, I had, uh, well, mine was the listing, but one of the buyers that came along, she was RD, I think FHA, and they put right in, in the offer that they would do any repairs that were required in order to pass inspection for for FHA for the lender and they they did end up having to do a, a few things and they you know I sort of over saw just you know just kind of kept an eye on them and they did a few things and it was reappraised and it went smoothly so I, I felt good about that because it was like I said I can't remember FHA or RD because nobody's able to get those anymore so it was yeah no I think nice. that's important because those are scary I mean I, I don't know that listing agents should be so scared of those programs but you know certainly if you get conventional or cash offers it's hard to compete but um, you know reassuring a seller that hey we're willing to take care of any nitpicky stuff that comes up you know we're willing to do some work to get your property like rest assured we're mm -hmm. going to take care of it I think that could be really important Anyone else with some creative stuff that they have seen that they want to share? Got a free oh. rent back for my sellers and a couple offers. It was multiple offers that did that. Um, so I thought that was really unique. I mean, minus the security deposit, because I think the law in Maine is you have to have a security deposit with a with any lease, and part of that is having a lease in place. But um, that was pretty unique to me and pretty shocking and very, very intriguing for the sellers. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, here's some other ideas um, uh, that, and again, some of these things may sound, you know, sound crazy, um, you know, but again, offering 30, 40, 50,000 more than asking price, you know, to me is pretty crazy. So, you know, in context, um, you know, I, I don't think some of these ideas, you know, are that crazy. And, and, you know, of course you're, you're doing them in lieu of, you know, maybe going way over, you know, you're, maybe you're still going 30,000 instead of 40,000 over, but you're throwing in, you know, some of these options, you know, just to see, you know, which, you know, you're throwing a bunch of stuff up against the wall and seeing what sticks, you know, different things are going to appeal to different sellers. Um, but probably, you know, they're all going to think, you know, wow, this buyer is really going all out um, to try to win this property. But, um, you know, some of the ideas that, that I got from this podcast were, you know, offering to pay some or all of the seller's closing costs, um, you know, perhaps minus commission, um, you know, that's sort of technically a seller closing cost, but maybe you're paying their deed prep, maybe the buyer's paying their transfer tax, um, you know, so maybe you're looking at, you know, three or four thousand dollars, um, and, and, you know, ultimately that's factored in, you know, to the net price that the seller is getting, but just the fact that your buyer is being creative and offering some of these um, options might be something that, you know, impresses the seller or impresses their agent. Um, 
some, some buyers have gone as far as to offer to pay for the seller's inspection, appraisal, or closing costs on the house that they're um, looking to buy. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the seller needs to buy to sell, um, and obviously the buyer that's willing and able to be the most flexible, um, you know, in that situation. Um, Carrie, do you want to cover some of those other other ideas that um, sure. buyers can put out there? Yeah, so I think just looping back to the escalation clause um, and how you're crafting that, um, because a lot of times there's not a um, not a comp that supports you know maybe how high you have to go in this market. So usually the conversation I have with my buyers is, you know, if you see this close for you know X amount, like what's that number to you that if you see it close for that, you're gonna be like shoot, I would have paid that, right? So that's like that top number you're going to use in that escalation. Um, and then using like a pretty like aggressive increment, um, you know, $500 is probably not going to be enough if, you know, some other terms are more favorable on the other offer you're competing against. So think like two to 5,000 increments um, on there. But, you know, I think, in this market that like we can't de depend on data like we could in you know past years so you're more offering with your heart i don't know um mm -hmm. than of your head um and that's where like asking them that question and you know, having them think about like okay like how much you know would i want to pay for this house and you know putting that as like you're all right if i see it you know you're offering 350 max and it if you see it close for 351, you're going to be fine with that. Okay. So, and then using, I use like odd numbers too, that, um, so you might be able to beat somebody out by a little bit. So maybe you're, um, escalating by $3,500 increments or, um, like your max is 351, right. Instead of 350, because a lot of other people might cap at an even number, um, so just going over by just a little bit of what you think other people might be using for that escalated number. Um, so all of these little tricks are like the price is right strategy, you know, like it's, <laughs> it's yeah. the price of the prize package. Yeah. It's just like, cause I think a lot of, you know, people are like, oh, it's listed for, you know, 300, I'm going to offer 350. Right. Um, so I'm not saying that that's the the yeah. number, but just say like a lot of people just round up to like an even or right, 50,000 more. So, well, if you're $51,000 more, then maybe that secures the property for your client. So just thinking like a little bit more outside the box about those numbers, um, because you're likely not going to be able to rely on, you know, five comps that say it's worth 350, right? Um, so I think that's a good thing to keep in mind with the escalation. Do you guys have any other questions about escalation clauses? No. Okay. Um, and then again, going back to like, we talked about this a little bit earlier, working with a good lender um, and somebody local um, is always better in my opinion. Um, you know, sometimes people will come to you with, you know, an out-of-state lender or like a bigger bank that, you know, is more like a call center type situation. Um, and again, if you have somebody local who maybe they're familiar with, or at least you can say, oh, they're right in you know, Portland or whatever. And hopefully that lender is calling out and um, use them and lean on these lender partners. Um, they should be willing to help you. And if you're working with somebody who is resistant to that or not, um, not on board with it, I think, you know, look at other options. Um, and Bill and Josh, Yvonne, and I can always help to um, connect you with some good lender partners because that can make all the difference in a competitive market. Um, just having familiarity with the lender and confidence that it is going to make it to closing, right? So that's, you can be offering, you know, everything to this seller, but if they don't feel confident in that lender, then they might go with somebody who is offering a little bit less, but they feel very confident with the financing situation. Um, you know, that's, you know, questions that, you know, Kim and I have talked about recently on offers that she's gotten. It's like, do you know this person? And, 
you know, it's all the detail, like the purchase price is important, but if you can never get that to closing, it really does not matter, right? So that's where you're gonna craft the strongest offer that you can to give that seller confidence that we can get this to closing and get them close to that number, if not that number that we're under contract for, right? So anything that you can do to shore that up and build that confidence with the listing agent and hopefully they're passing that on to the seller, that's just gonna help your client um, secure that house, right? Um, so part of that is do not settle for a pre-qualification letter. Like that is not acceptable in this market. I wouldn't, if I was on the listing end of it and you sent me a pre-qual letter, I would say likely they haven't looked at any financial documents. They might not even have pulled their credit. And usually that's just like a initial sort of like, oh, I make, you know, $50,000 a year and I've got a 700 credit square score. I swear I do. You know what I mean? Like very casual, usually preliminary type conversations. And we want buyers who are pre-approved that they've gone through all those steps. They've provided bank statements, W-2s, um, tax returns to the lender. Um, so again, working closely with the lender and getting your buyer to put in that extra work and counseling your buyer on why we're doing this work. And you know, sometimes it takes a few failed offers with a client to get them in that mindset of, okay, how do we make some changes um, to adjust to be more competitive? So you can say, well, remember when I told you to use my local lender and to, you know, get your pre-approval, you know, sometimes it's a multi-step process with buyers, you know, um, as you can see on your faces, you all know what I'm talking about. So um, yeah, I think that just stay, you know, you're the expert, you know, stay um, in that role and guiding them through it because obviously you want them to be successful in getting a home and just letting your buyers dictate what they're going to do is really not going to work. Like you have to take control and be the expert um, and help guide them. So what else do we have here, Bill? Um, oh, larger earnest money deposits. Um, definitely beef those up to wherever um, they are comfortable and they can go. Um, I think like the days of a thousand, two thousand dollars is kind of I don't see that very much at all anymore. Um, we talked about the type of financing. So getting that, um, yeah, the, str the strongest program that they can qualify for, go with that. Um, also, like I see some of my clients who might have the ability to pay cash for a property, but they would rather finance. So adding something about that in section 26 to give a little bit more um, weight to the offer of like, hey, if something happens with my financing, which I don't think it will, but I do have the ability to pay cash and maybe you are showing proof of funds for that. Um, similarly with, um, if you're offering to pay an appraisal gap, sending over proof of funds showing, I actually really do have this money available. Um, you know, that can add to the strength of the offer. So physically showing, you know, a bank statement or whatever they're comfortable with, a letter from their bank saying they have X amount available to cover. Um, so thinking about that, um, the other thing I see buyers doing is saying like, okay, I'm doing a 20% down conventional offer, but I'm willing to switch that to, you know, 10% down if I have to, to cover an appraisal gap. Um, and, you know, getting confirmation from the lender that that would still work. Um, it's really just being flexible and thinking, like, how can we strengthen this up so that the seller knows we're thinking ahead. And if there is a roadblock, this is how we're going to deal with it um, right up front instead of waiting, you know, three or four weeks into the contract and then having to deal with those solutions. Like you already have them ironed out right up front. And I think that goes a long way. Um, with sellers in this market. Yeah, uh, I think that's basically what we had here, right, Bill? Um, yeah. yeah. Does anyone else have any questions or things that you want to share that are working for you? I have a couple of thoughts. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned, we were just talking about lenders, like out-of-state lenders or internet lenders or whatever. 
Um, I had some folks that they had an out-of-state bank. I, you know, I, I spoke with the lender, had the letter of pre-approval, felt, felt okay about it. But in the end, um, the lender wanted to use their title company and it was an out-of-state title company. And they ended up sending this bonehead notary to do the closing. And I was, I was just blown away by it. So ne- ever since then, I've insisted on, you know, if it, if it was some sort of funky bank, I've insisted on a local title company so that we have a real, you know, somebody we know locally doing the closing and getting it to close. Yeah. And then the other thing was um, proof of funds. Another one fall apart at the last minute. The the down the EMD or or the down payment I'm sorry, the down payment that the buyers had to come up with was twenty percent and it was a high priced uh, thing they needed to come up with like fifty thousand um, dollars and that it they did not put anything in the offer about contingent upon getting a home equity line or or anything like that last minute it fell apart because they couldn't get the equity line which is where they were going to get their thousand dollars to put down on the, the mm. property so i learned a lesson there if it if it is sort of a um you know like if they say oh we're putting you know 25 40 percent down and you know we've got all this cash uh, to get proof of funds even for the the down payment yeah and that's where carrie talked about you know in the old days a prequal was just fine but with a full pre-approval, the lender has, in theory, you know, verified those assets, you know, that they're really there. Um, and, and certainly, you know, having a conversation with the lender, you know, you can verify that. But that's a great point, Connie, just making sure. I mean, the, the agent, cert, you know, certainly if the agent knew, they, they certainly shouldn't have written the offer, you know, like that, um, and, and that's going to be too bad if we're if we're going to be put in the position now that we have to verify, you know, down payments. But you know, again, um, that that's I think a big difference yeah. between the prequal and the pre-approval is the, those assets have been verified. Um, you know, including the ability to pay that appraisal gap. You know, they might say, "Oh, we're willing to cover," you know, a fifty thousand dollar appraisal gap. Well okay, we're, we're going to need some proof of funds here because, you know, you said you're putting 20% down and the property's 400. So that's 80,000 and you're, you know, you're willing to cover, cover a, you know, $20,000 appraisal gap. So do you really have a hundred thousand, you know, available in the bank or, you know, mm-hmm. is it something you have to cash out of your 401? And if the stock market crashes next week, are you really going to want to pull that out? Yeah. So. That's a great point, Connie. Um, and that a lot of people are tapping into equity in their current homes to buy another place and not making it contingent, which is totally fine to do, right? But if that line is not already established and you couldn't go pull against it tomorrow, then that's still contingent upon financing. That's yep. not a cash offer. Um, you know, some people are using that, you know, you know $300,000 and trying to make a cash offer, but they haven't even tried to go apply for that line of credit yet. And while, yeah, that's great in theory, but that's a financed offer because just like you said, that can get declined. They could not end up getting the equity that they think they have there. Um, So yeah, that's a a slippery slope. So again, you're having buyers make offers with equity lines. Um, Definitely ask a few more questions about it and make sure that it is established and open. Um, if not, just explain to them that until it's established and open that you are still making a financed offer. I actually just had this conversation with a potential um, listing client just the other day and suggested that she go talk to the lender about either a home equity line of credit or fund funds um, so that she can purchase before selling. Um, but has anyone come across a home equity line of credit that, that you can close like within two or three months of sell of of buying and then selling your other one without a penalty yeah so morgan camplin at homebridge actually just came out with a new product um and they i we should have her come and talk to us about it because it is pretty unique um and she um, she was on the meeting talking about it that you were busy the last time but yeah so she basically it's this like gap filler type program. So, um, yeah, so she, and it's like a soft credit pull and it will kind of just tell you what, um, 
equity you might qualify for, and then you can decide if you want to go forward with it. But it's a great like interim, like gap filler type program. Um, so definitely, um, you know, Bill, that might be another lunch and learn we want to offer here, but um, this is another way to get creative to free up some equity to make it so you're not making contingent offers um, and you can kind of move and then sell your house once you're moved out. Okay. Yeah, but Kim, that, that's a good question because a lot of them, <laughs> what's that? I was just saying, I told her to go talk to TJ who works with Morgan. So perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. yeah a lot of those equity line, you know, for the rest of you, um, a lot of those equity lines do have, you know, uh, uh, pre prepayment, you know, penalties or, or if they're, I, I don't know if it's called a prepayment penalty, but if they close it out, you know, within a certain amount of time, but usually the penalty, it's not very high. It's like, you know, might be a 300 i've heard of 300 dollars fees or 500 dollars fee so sometimes it's just the cost of doing business okay to tap into this much equity it, it's going to cost me you know 500 dollars you know when i pay it off um, you know of course they won't do it um, generally i don't think they'll do it if the house is on the market you know most okay. banks aren't going to want to do it so again something to to counsel your your buyer slash seller you know, to set this up ahead of time before you put the house on the market, because if the lender sees, you know, if Gorham Savings Bank or whoever it is sees the house on the market, you know, they know that they're never going to make any money, you know, on that loan because the, the you know, the client's going to close it out early. So, um, so sometimes we've actually had to pull stuff off the market so the seller could, could get an equity line. But, um, you know, the, the big thing, and, you know, we already covered it. Uh, maybe it's the last thing we cover, but, you know, th this is, a, you know, all of these things, this is a serious one hour counseling session, you know, at least, you know, with your buyer, you know, covering all of these, you know, options, maybe you have a little checklist that, you know, that you go down, or maybe you, um, uh, maybe you build a standard addendum that has all of these, you know, it, you know, maybe it's got 15 options or clauses or contingencies in it that your buyer um, can choose from like, oh, we like this one or we're comfortable with this one. Okay, we're not comfortable with a rent back or we're, you know, we're not comfortable with this, but, you know, give them all the options. You never want them to, you know, feel like, um, you know, we just had a situation where, you know, an agent called me and, you know, their buyer had lost out on the ninth you know, offer um, or whatever. And, you know, the agent had, you know, presented all of, you know, or most of the poss possible scenarios. There was a few they didn't, um, you know, but it was just a matter of, you know, making sure the buyer doesn't feel that it's your fault <laughs> that, that they're losing. I mean, you never want them to lose confidence um, in you. So the more options that you present them and, you know, if they're losing, it's either their choice because they're not comfortable with what they need to do to win, you know, or it's things that they just can't overcome. They're not qualified high enough. They can't possibly do a conventional loan, you know, whatever it might be. And, you know, which is still hard, but you just don't want them to, to ever feel like, you know, to lose confidence in their agent that there's more that, you know, we could have done. Um, so, uh, you know, give them all the options. And, you know, like Carrie said, it, it's kind of a learning process, unfortunately, which means we're going to be wasting some time. Um, but, you know, after they lose out on three or four, maybe they'll start, you know, listening to you and, you know, be willing to offer more than a thousand dollars earnest money or, or be willing to put a cap on their investigations or maybe get rid of it, you know, entirely or whatever it might be. So if nobody has anything else, we will uh, conclude this class. I'll, I'll send out um, Carrie's and I's notes, uh, you know, for the class. Um, so everyone has those and um, Hope you all, you know, have a good day and better luck on the next <laughs> bidding war situation that you have. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. All right. Thanks, guys. Have Thanks. a good day. Have a good day. Thank you.